A tiny uninhabited island may not seem very important, until you zoom out. The Kachathivu Island, located in the Polk Strait between India and Sri Lanka, has become a hot topic of debate in the Indian politics. In Kachathivu Island. Kacha Island. This island was once a disputed area between the two South Asian countries until it was ceded to Sri Lanka in 1974. So, why was Kachathivu a point of contention between the two nations? And why is India determined to retake this island after 50 years of Sri Lankan possession? Or are they? One fisherman was killed and five others injured after Sri Lankan Navy opened fire near an island off the Tamil Nadu coast. To understand this conflict, we must know the history of Kachathivu Island. Located about 12 nautical miles from India's southernmost point, Rameswaram, and roughly 11 nautical miles from Sri Lanka's Delft Island, it emerged due to a volcanic eruption in the 14th century. Initially, the island was believed to be under the control of Ceylon's Jaffna Kingdom, and later came under the reign of India's Ramnad Kingdom in the early 17th century. Ever since, the Raja of Ramnad is said to have owned the island, which later became part of the Madras Presidency during the British colonial rule. This is a map of southern India, published in 1726 by a Dutch minister named François Valentin. It includes an island called Chagodina, which refers to Kachathivu being part of India. In 1822, the British East India Company is said to have signed an agreement with the Ramnad King, obtaining the use of seven islands for trading, including Kachathivu. However, in 1921, the British Ceylon asserted their sovereignty over the island during discussions to demarcate the fishery line in the Park Strait. Ceylon's position was further strengthened when the government of British India either admitted that the island belonged to Ceylon or had not refuted when such assertions were made by them. India's claim relied on the Ramnad Kingdom's records of tax collection until 1948, when the island was taken over by the Madras government following the abolition of Zamindari system. India also pointed out the lack of direct documentary evidence supporting Sri Lanka's original ownership of Kachathivu Island throughout history. This is a 1687 map of Ceylon by British mapmaker Rob Morden, recorded during the Dutch occupation of Ceylon. It shows Delft Island as part of Ceylon, but there's no mention of Kachathivu Island. Here's another map of Dutch Ceylon, published in 1718 by Philips Bailde. This map also has no mention of Kachathivu Island being part of Ceylon. During the 17th to 19th centuries, numerous maps created by British, Dutch, and Portuguese cartographers lack any reference to the island. This omission is significant and suggests that the island was not considered part of Ceylon during the Dutch and British colonial periods. Before we talk about Sri Lanka's claims, please hit like if you're enjoying this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it. Now, back to the video. Sri Lanka claims that Kachathivu has always been part of Ceylon throughout the history. To support their claim, they relied on administrative records from Dutch Ceylon and some Portuguese maps referring to Kachathivu as belonging to Ceylon. For example, this map published in 1750, and this detailed Victorian map of Ceylon published in 1851, shows Kachadiv Island as part of Ceylon. In addition, the exercise of jurisdiction over the island since 1924 by Ceylon had been more or less continuous without any protests from India. Although historical evidence made a strong case for India's claim, but the lack of constructive response by British colonial government weakened India's position. After examination of the claims from both sides, it was believed the case was at best 50-50. In effect, India's claim was as good as Sri Lanka's claim. On the other hand, India was concerned about the situation of Indian Tamils in Sri Lanka, who were descendants of tea plantation laborers taken from Indian state of Tamil Nadu to Ceylon in the 19th century. After the independence of Ceylon in 1948, these groups were stripped of their citizenship, rendering them stateless. The issue had played a major part in the relations of the two nations for decades, and on the 28th of June 1974, both nations signed an agreement to grant citizenships to 150,000 Tamils, whose status was left unresolved in the previous agreements of 1954 and 64. One can debate whether these two reasons convinced the Indian leadership to eventually concede the Kachathivu Island in the Historic Waters Agreement of 1974, subject to foregoing Indian fishermen and pilgrims enjoy access to visit the island. 
The vessels from both nations would enjoy traditional rights in each other's waters. However, a second agreement signed in 1976 realigned the maritime borders in Gulf of Manar and the Bay of Bengal. The new border between India and Sri Lanka now looked like this, an invisible line that marks where India's territorial waters end and Sri Lanka's begin. This border made it officially illegal for fishermen from either side to cross over into each other's waters, contrary to what was permitted in the 1974 agreement. Another concern is the rights of the Indian fishermen, who have been facing detentions by the Sri Lankan Navy. These detentions are often linked to Kachathivu Island, with some suggesting that if the island is retrieved, they will no longer have to face the aggression of Lankan Navy, but the problems of Indian fishermen are more complex than they appear. In the 1960s, India was facing a financial crisis, and the government was looking for new ways to stimulate the economy. So, they turned to seafood exports, and gave subsidies to fishermen to buy better boats called trawlers, which can drop nets with heavy weights on them to scrape the seabed in search of seafood. The Indian fishermen quickly adopted these new boats, and soon there were thousands of these trawlers. Although very effective, this method causes damage to the seafloor's ecosystem, and if left unchecked, depletes fish supplies very quickly. By the late 1970s, the Indian fishermen needed new waters to fish and they began moving across the border into Sri Lankan waters. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka was descending into a violent civil war that would result in over 150,000 deaths. As a security precaution, the Sri Lankan Navy banned most fishing activities in an effort to weaken the Tamil rebels, who were reliant on fish. The situation dragged on until the early 2000s, allowing the Indian trawlers to fish these waters with little repercussion. When the war ended, the fishing bans were lifted. When the Sri Lankan fishermen went out on their small boats, they could not compete with the well-equipped Indian trawlers fishing in these waters. This is where things really start to heat up. The Sri Lankan Navy stepped in and started cracking down on Indian fishermen that were poaching in Sri Lankan waters. The Indian government occasionally step in to free the detained fishermen, but none of their actions have led to a concrete solution to the conflict. Stopping trawlers, a practice that has bolstered the livelihood of these fishermen for years, would create more frustration among the people. By now, it should be clear that even if India were to get back the Kachathivu island, the problems faced by Indian fishermen will continue. The island's status as part of Sri Lanka was established through a bilateral agreement. If India withdraws, it could jeopardize its other treaties with its neighbors and harm its global reputation, a risk India cannot afford.